the brutality that comes from those calls. You know what to listen for. You know when someone picks up the phone who doesn't actually own the house, but they're messing with you to think that they do own the house. And they're, telling, they're talking about how they do goat sacrifices in the backyard. Hey, my name is Chris Gibbons. Some of you already know me, some of you don't. Uh, if you had an opportunity for us to meet up this last weekend uh, at the Dallas Conference for Stepstone Realty uh, here on the weekend of uh, May 5th and 6th, 2023, uh, I met with some awesome people there. I uh, got a lot of great information, a lot of great new contacts, and really had an awesome opportunity to you know, build my connections and build uh, a lot of you know, good relationships. I, I really am excited to see where a lot of you guys go uh, from here on out. Uh, now, if you didn't catch my class, I did teach a class uh, for, um, for the conference uh, going over cold calling. Now, my cold calling strategy focuses more heavily on the investment side, uh, more for buying for yourself, buying for a flip or a rental, or primarily wholesale. Because uh, if you don't know me already, I'm a wholesaler. Uh, that's really all I focus on. So the cold calling technique that I taught my class really focused in on that. So if you took my class, or even if you didn't take my class and you just want to really learn more, learn more I, what I did here is I put together this video, and this video is going to go over that class. Uh, actually, is the recording of that class. So if you missed it, this is up your opportunity now to watch that class again and really hopefully get some good value out of what that class had to offer. So I'm hoping you have some, uh, you get a good experience from this video. I hope it answers a lot of the questions you have. But if you don't get the questions that you have answered from this video, I encourage you to reach out to me. My contact information should be attached to the bottom of this video. Reach out to me and let's talk about it. Let me see how I can help you out in any way, if I can answer any questions, if I can ease any doubt that you might have about wholesaling or cold calling and really see what I can do to help you out with you know, your progression or your business or whatever you need on that end. But I hope this is beneficial to you. Uh, and if we haven't met yet, I look forward to hopefully meeting you either at the next convention or the next Stepstone meeting that we have. And hopefully we can build a business, you know, multiple businesses together or work together at some capacity. But I look forward to definitely meeting with you guys soon and talk with you more. And if you do like what you're seeing here, this is gonna be a kickoff to what is to come. So feel free, please hit those little links down below, subscribe, like if you want to, and hopefully in time I can give you some value that you guys are looking for. Um, not sure how frequently I will post, but I do plan on posting pretty frequently to give you guys some information that you're looking for and hopefully benefit you in some way. I'm gonna stop talking now. This video is already gonna be long enough as it is. It was about a two hour class that we conducted. So I'm gonna go ahead, grab a coffee, you go ahead and enjoy it. All right, is everyone here? All right. Good morning, everyone. How's, it, how's everyone's good morning going so far? Are we awake? Caffeinated? Good, because we're going to talk about the most boring subject ever, and that's cold calling. I'm kidding. No, uh, who here has ever done any cold calling? All right, and I see majority of the men are bald from it. That's the way you're supposed to be. Okay. <laughs> You see what happens when you cold call? <laughs> Except for you, Kenny. I hate you. Um, no, so from your cold calling experience, like what have you guys, like, have you guys enjoy it? Do you guys do it every day? Like, what, what are your opinions on cold calling? I don't like it. You don't like it? I don't think anyone really does. I'll be honest with you. From your cold calling, like, do you, do you like it? What are your experiences from it? You don't mind it? Mm -hmm. This is the key to cold calling, actually. But I'm sure you'll get into that. But yeah. It, you're just meeting someone. Right. And if you take the pressure off about what your end goal is, mm -hmm. you just meet people. That's the key to cold calling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. That's the whole class, everybody. Thanks for coming. I appreciate. <laughs> No, she's right. And we're definitely gonna, gonna get into that a little bit. So one thing, um, today's class is not gonna be about everything about cold calling. We're not gonna talk about lists, we're not gonna talk about, talk about tools or anything like that. This is gonna be more of diving into just the structure of the cold call and kind of taking away a lot of the hesitation that a lot of people have about cold calling, right? Because the main thing that people think when they think of cold calling is they think of, Oh, I'm bothering people, no one's gonna like it, I'm gonna sound like a telemarketer, 
all these things are going to distract you from doing the actual call itself. And a lot of people are like, well, what do I say? How do I say it? How do I not sound like a robot? Oh, I'm just going to hire some person in the Philippines for $4 an hour to take care of it for me, right? So a lot of people make these things up in their heads about cold calling, and it makes it to where they don't actually do it. Maybe they'll buy the dialer. They'll go and buy a list of 1,000 contacts, and it just sits there because they don't know what to say. So hopefully today we can go over what to say, how to best present it, and just have good quality conversations, right? So who am I? Let's kind of start that off a little bit. I'm a tech nerd turned into real estate. So I spent my entire younger life doing all technology, you know, working in call centers, dealing with computer stuff. And you can see I got cameras galore in here. I'm a nerd. That's what I do. I'm actually a former acquisition agent for Networth Realty. Please do not judge me. We all have to start somewhere, and when I first got started into wholesale, that's what I do is wholesale, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. You know, I got into it, went to a Robert Kiyosaki thing for two days, mind blown, sat there for five years doing absolutely nothing. Finally got my real estate license, joined Net Worth, was there for a little under a year, realized I didn't need them, so I bounced out of there. From there, I started buying properties in bulk for a few hedge funds. So I know it can, kind of became like a buzzword in the last few years, hedge funds. Uh, I was actually working pretty directly as a realtor uh, with Keller Williams with a few larger hedge funds buying a few 50, 60 homes a month. So I was able to really hone, hone in on that end. And that's actually where I started adopting cold calling. And I'm just a total known cheapskate. I hate spending money. I hate you know marketing, it's expensive as crap. I can't stand paying 15, 20 K a month in direct mail. I, I just simply can't do it. So for me, if I could find a cheaper way to do it, I will. So that's why I went to cold calling. Because cold calling, it's all a matter of my time, not my money. So that question with your cold calling comes to, what's your end goal with the cold call? So cold calling is just a marketing technique, but what is your end goal? Because you have to know that at the beginning. Yep. Can we get a copy? Yeah, no, you're fine. I will provide a copy of the, of the slide deck. So you, you will have all these slides. Mm -hmm. As well as I'm going to make sure I provide a, the video footage as well in case you guys want that later. The reason why I say keep your end goal in mind first, I guess let's start. Who here is only buying for themselves? They're just buying real estate. Okay, you got a few hands here. Who's doing listings? Okay. Who's wholesaling? Okay, perfect. Now, why would I say that's important first? Why is it important to know your, your position before you make the phone call? Determine if you're the ask or the estimate. The approach. The approach, right. So the approach is first. The second comes the legality, right? Let's say you are calling someone to try to list their home. And your first talk to them is like, hey, I want to list your property. But you come to find out, oh, this is a junky home. Now I just want to buy it. Can you do that? No. Exactly. You've offered them agency. So it's a big, big, big problem. So that's why for me, I start every conversation as a buy. I always want to buy first, every single time. So that's for me. Again, I'm only a wholesaler. I don't do anything else. I'm a licensed realtor, but I don't do listings. But I start with the buy in, in mind first. So buy, flip, buy and hold. Obviously, that's kind of lumped up into one big bucket because we're always making an offer to purchase. Listing is totally different. If your initial goal is to list a property, I can't help you. I've never done that. So this is all focused around how to position yourself as a buyer, which if you're a steps on agent, that should be your primary goal to buy. All right, what cold calling is not? Cold calling is not a deal strategy. People get that confused all the time. It's not a closing strategy. It is not an investment strategy. Cold calling is a marketing strategy to ignite a conversation, just like she was saying here before. It is not the end all be all. When you're making a cold call, you're not getting on the call to close a deal on the first call. A one call close does not, a one call close, I can't say doesn't exist, but it rarely exists, right? What you wanna do is you're making a call, initial call to start a conversation to build a relationship with someone and get a little bit of information to rack yourself up for the second call, right? So don't try to get all your eggs out in one basket on the first call, build the connection, get on to the next call. 
Oh, I just kind of skipped on my next slide right there. So it's just that. It's all it is is just building. It's a lead generation strategy to build the connection with the homeowner. Any questions so far? Awesome. All right, cold calling. Is this how you guys feel when you cold call? <laughs> that's how I feel. I feel like a total goof when I cold call. And that's okay. That's totally okay. If you feel uncomfortable, you feel like a goof when you cold call, it means you're doing it right. If you feel like you're crisp and you're polished and you are counting your ums and your ahs and you're just all nice and crisp, you're probably doing it wrong because then you sound like a telemarketer. One thing I always tell people whenever they come onto my team and I'm training them on a cold call is I have telemarketer flags. If they sound like a telemarketer, I stop them, retrain. It's like the last thing we want to do is sound like a telemarketer. I want you to sound like the bumbling fool over here who doesn't know what they're doing because that will build better trust and relationship with the homeowner because you don't sound like a telemarketer. Because think that the people that we're calling for the most part, most of them have some kind of financial distress going on, right? So if they have some kind of financial distress, they probably have banks calling them, they have repo people calling them, they have all these people trying to barrel down to get money from them. You're no different on that end because now you're trying to get them to sell their house to you, but you need to get them to trust you more at the beginning. So why do we choose cold calling? And I'm just gonna blow through this really quick because we wanna really get to the meat and potatoes here. It's proactive. Who here does direct mail? Okay, James, you can leave, you're okay. <laughs> direct mail is expensive, right? And for me, I have some bad ADD. I can't sit around and wait for people to call, you know, to call to me. I need to get on the phone today. It drives me nuts. I've done that. I'll batch out a bunch of letters, and I'm just sitting there like this. And then, then the phone will ring, and then what ends up happening to me when my phone rings from that, ma that marketing? I don't want to answer it. I don't want to answer it. But if I'm proactively marketing, I'm now actually in the dialing seat, I have my headset on, I push go, and I'm waiting for the dialer to bring me a call. I'm in it, I'm locked in, and I'm ready to go for it. It's more cost effective. It's cheap or free. I hate saying the word free because you still gotta pay for the list, you still gotta pay for the numbers, you still gotta pay for your cell phone. But who here has a cell phone? Yeah, it's all stuff you were gonna pay for anyway. Right, you're already gonna pay for these things anyway. You're already gonna pay for your list if you're doing direct mail or if you're doing SMS or voice blasts. Don't do voicemail blasts, by the way, illegal, or can be illegal. You have a lot of problems with voice blasts. But those are very, very costly. You're already paying for a cell phone. You're already paying for phone numbers. You're already paying for these things. Just use what you already have. You don't have to buy into Batch Dialer or Mojo Dialer to start off with. You can start off just by getting a free Google Voice number and just dialing. Get you started for a minute, but you want to definitely upgrade. It's scalable. Once you track your KPIs with your cold calling, you can just know from there, if I talk to so many people and have this many conversations with homeowners, I can predict how, I can, uh, how many deals I can get from there. So then you can know, okay, now if I hire on this many cold callers to do the exact same performance, you can scale it upwards. And it's totally outsourceable. But I'm gonna say this with an asterisk. Do not hire somebody to cold call until you've made at least 1,000 calls yourself. What was that? Why is that? How can you train someone to cold call if you haven't done it? Quality control. Quality control. And I, I've seen that before. I've seen so many people, they will start off like, oh, I want a cold call. I bought Brent Daniels TTP course. I hired someone in the Philippines and I just gave them the course. And I'm getting no leads. They're calling 10,000 numbers a week and I'm getting nothing. It's like, okay, well, have you checked their calls? Have you listened to their calls? Have you sat in on calls with them. No, there's your problem. You don't know what to listen for. You don't know what things to hear. You don't know these things. So you want to at least do 1,000 calls yourself. And that's not just hit the dialer and it takes through 1,000 calls. That's you having 1,000 conversations. Because then you know the brutality that comes from those calls. You know what to listen for. You know when someone picks up the phone who doesn't actually own the house, but they're messing with you to think that they do own the house. And they're, telling, they're talking about how they do goat sacrifices in the backyard. True story. All right, so now we're gonna really kind of get into it. So the top tips for cold calling. Don't read the script verbatim. In your handout, I have a script into there. 
Don't read that script line for line. Don't read it as the Bible. It's not the Bible. That script is nothing more than a guideline. It's a bullet point. What I always use the script for is I use the first two, three lines in the script. I will read that religiously every single time because it's the entry level. But the other points are just bullet points. And they help me get back on the conversation points. So if we get distracted from the conversation, we start talking about people and their horses and their gardens or whatever for relationship building, I can always go back to my script to find that next point to talk about. Don't sound like a robot. This is probably the hardest thing to train, especially if you're hiring people in the Philippines or overseas. Don't sound like a robot. Because if you're on the script or you're on a call, the last thing you want to do is, oh, hi, Mr. James. My name is Chris. How can I help you? Or do you want to sell your house today? Does that sound natural? Does that sound relatable? No, thank you. No, thank you. Exactly. What I always try to tell people is think about what if you're at, I always say a coffee house because I'm a coffeeholic like no other. Let's say you're at a coffee house and you're sitting across from your friend and you're having a conversation with them. Are you going to talk to your friend across, the, you know, across from you in some kind of script format like a robot? Or are you just going to have a natural conversation? Like, yeah, hey, how's it going, buddy? Let, let's talk, right? I'm not going to say like a presenter and like, hey, let's all talk professionally. Think of it like a natural conversation between friends, right? You're calling these people cold. You're calling them totally out of the blue. They don't know who you are. You have to build some trust and relationship with them. Are they going to build some trust and relationship with someone who just calls them randomly and they sound like a crisp, clean, professional person? No, they're not. They're going to have their alarms going off and they're going to click on you. So just treat it like you're talking to that person across from the coffee house or your neighbor. Stand up and smile. This is probably the biggest one. I've had so many people that will come work with me and they're just doing this all day. They're sitting down and there's just something different with your energy and your emotion when you're sitting down. You don't sound, you're not as ready for it. You're kind of more lazier. Your voice doesn't project as well. You're just kind of more in a lazier, fa in, not a lazier fashion, just a lazier mindset. So for me, and it drives my wife nuts because I never sit, like even at the house. So that everybody will be lounging around the house. I'm walking around the house all day long. But I have a wireless headset that I use, and you can get them pretty cheap these days. And I'm literally walking around my office on calls like this. I'm maybe fidgeting with something in my hands, but I'm walking around. I'm standing up and I'm smiling. Probably the biggest one right there. You gotta smile. You ever heard that term smile and dial? It's true. Mm -hmm. People can hear your smile, and that's one of the. That's like my number one thing I do. Once that phone starts ringing, mm -hmm. I put a smile on in, in, in anticipation of them answering the phone. Right. Because I want that smile to be my first word. Yep. And it, it really does. It changes the the response. It changes absolutely everything. Because think of it, you can hear. It's weird how you can hear it, even if you're having the crappiest day in the world. You know, the world's on fire, and the worst day in the world. You can hear when someone's just talking to you with, hey, do you want to buy, do you want to sell, my, sell me your house? Do you want an offer? <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> hey, just curious if you ever consider getting an offer on your house. It's a big difference when you put a smile on your, fa on your face, right? That energy passes through even though they can't see you. <clears throat> this is probably the next one I really love. I say this on every bullet point, I love this point. Don't be the direct <laughs> buyer. And this may sound weird. People always want to be get on the phone. Yeah, I'm the buyer. I got my checkbook. Let's go for this. You've actually weakened your position in a big way. You've really weakened your buying position because now you kind of put your cards on the table. They know they're talking with the direct buyer. Your negotiating goes out the window, right? I always like to be that middleman. It's like, well, I don't know. I got to talk to my partner about this. Really, I'm just that guy with the ugly face and the pretty voice on the side of the phone who gets to talk to people all day long and ask questions. My partner, he's the numbers guy. He really controls the purse. I say my partner or my wife all the time. They really control the purse on this one. You know, I, I, for me, I, I couldn't even tell you what we could offer, right? Because you don't want to give an offer on the first call. Never give an offer on the first call. Never, ever, ever. And we've already kind of talked about this. You're not looking to close on the first call. Don't expect it. The biggest reason is if you give an offer on the very first call, 
think about it. They're probably getting 20, 30 calls a day from other investors, right? And all these investors are going into Zillow and they're just giving them some number off of Zillow. But if you go into, the, into there and you're just collecting information, it's that multiple step of making multiple calls to them. You're building deeper relationship with them. They're now knowing you better. They're gonna know, okay, oh, yeah, I've talked to Kenny. I've talked to Chris. I've talked to this in person. Uh, some other, I don't know, I've talked to so many people, right? Who'd, who'd know? I was gonna say, so one thing I do when, in, when I'm having that get to know you conversation, yeah. um, I'll find a little small connection, you know, yeah. whether it's, you know, oh, I have a cat too, or whatever. Then when I call them back, I'll reiterate, I'll say, oh, this is Rebecca, we spoke the other day, you remember, I yep. have a cat just like you, or whatever it is, whatever that connection might mm -hmm. be. That neuron pathway connects. Yeah, and then they're like, oh, yeah, 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 I remember that was a great conversation. Then mm -hmm. is when, like, we start talking a little bit deeper. Yeah, because as soon as they hang up with you, five minutes later, their yeah, cat just, right, well, their, their cat just pissed in their rug and they forgot forgotten all about you, right? <laughs> you, you, you have three to five minutes on the phone call with these people, if you're lucky, and they're going to forget about you right afterwards because something else is going on. So if you have that second follow-up call, A, 90% of these investors that are calling them don't call them back. They don't. So if you, if you call them back, you've, already, you've deepened that connection a little, bit, that, that a little bit better. You've deepened that trust with them a little bit better. Setting a time to, a certain time to call them back mm -hmm. later, you think? Yeah. So yeah, I always try to follow it up with, some people say, I'll give you a call back in a day or two. I call them back that same day, every single time. I always say, hey, let me pass this over to my partner and talk to him about it. Is it okay if I give you a call back in an hour or two? It's always that same day. <clears throat> this part is missed by everybody though. Actively listening. How many times have you been on a phone call with somebody and you can tell they're just not listening to you? Like you're over here talking or you're saying things and it's just dead silence on their side. Or you'll say something to them and then they re-ask that question back of something you already answered. That's a big problem. So actively listening is actually super easy. It's way easier than you think it is. And it drives my wife nuts because I do it with her all the time, even though she says I don't listen. It's just giving them little keys and clues while they're talking that you're listening to them. So if they're saying stuff about their dog or cat or talk about the house, oh, okay, uh-huh, oh, sure, really? Oh, okay, cool, no. Little stuff like that, it's adding these tiny little words yeah, a little feedback words. It lets them know that you're listening to them and they're going to keep talking to you. The biggest thing with cold calls is you don't want to control, you want to control the conversation, but you control the conversation by not dominating the conversation. Does that make sense? Because if you're talking so much, you've actually lost control. You're over dominating it and you're losing that trust with the homeowner. The, the key to cold calling is to create quality conversations with people, to have quality conversations with homeowners about their properties and building the trust and relationship with them on the first call, and then dig into why they're gonna hate you later with your insulting offer on another call. Any questions there so far? All right, sweet. All right, so the best times to call and these will always change. And you want to try to mitigate this to what works best for you. The best time to call is whenever you're available to call, first off. So don't use this as a hard and fast rule. And you'll also notice this as you start calling and you watch your reports to see, okay, I know if I call between this time to this region, a lot of people don't pick up. So you wanna play around with this a little bit. But if you don't have these times available in your workday, maybe you still work a normal job, maybe you have other things going on, call when you can, whenever you're most available to. But these are some times that we found to be the most effective for most people. Uh, evening times sometimes can be the best because that's when people are home. But you also wanna be careful because that's when they're getting people, their kids in bed, that's when they're making dinner and just it interrupts their time even more. <clears throat> If the seller is not motivated to sell and they just want to get a value for their home, they're not worth your time. They're, they're just going to waste your time. They're going to suck away your time. Try to get up the phone as fast as possible. Because how many times have you talked to somebody and like, well, what's your offer? Like immediately. Well, A, again, I don't give them the offer on the first call, but if they're just looking to see what their home is worth. They're not really motivated. 
someone who's truly motivated, they're gonna open up their life story to you. They're gonna talk to you. They're gonna open, they're gonna tell you why they're having these problems. If you get a talker on the phone, that means you got a good call. Unless they're talking about goat sacrificians in their backyard, then you got a problem. I joke, but that was a real call I had. All right, so on every call, these are, there are four things on every single call that you want to have with a motivated homeowner. And these are four key things you want to extract from every single call. Now, if you can get all four, it's great. If you can get three, that's probably the best. But you want to get about between two and three of these from every single call before you move off of it. So the four pillars is going to be price. Now, I've hit that too many times. Timeline, situation or motivation, and condition of the property. So I start off with price pretty much, very, pretty much early on in the call. I try to get an idea of what they're looking to get for it immediately. Most all the time they're gonna tell me, you call me, you make me the offer. You tell me what, what you're willing to pay. But I layer the price throughout the call. Because if I can get, obviously we all know, if we can get a price out of them first, normally that's the much better price that you're ever gonna get. Timeline, how soon do they need to sell? Are they looking to sell in the next week? Do they need to have this thing sold yesterday? Do they need to wait for their kids to graduate college? Right? When do they need to sell? If it's longer than six months, put them in a follow-up timeline and just check back with them from time to time. If it's within the next three months, that's something active for you to really start focusing in on. This is why the first call is critical because the first call is that weeding out process. You're weeding out, is this someone I need to focus on right now or further on down the pipeline? The situation, what is the pain? What's the motivation that they are having that's causing them to sell this property? If there's no pain, you have no deal, right? There's always gonna be some kind of pain, whether it's a tired landlord who's ready just to retire and get out of the business and they have this whole lot of properties they wanna get rid of, or maybe they're an accidental landlord. They bought this house, they couldn't sell it because they bought it at the height of the market in 2021. Now it's 2023 and they can't sell for what they owe on it because they got some stupid mortgage on it. So now there's some you know, landlord by accident or whatever the case may be, or they have someone just passed away and they just got this property they need to sell, or the roof is caving in, whatever the case may be. But if they just bought the house, it's brand new, the house has no problems to it, they have little to no equity at all, and they just want a value for their home, how much you can do with that? Unless you want to list it. But again, you got to make sure that conversation is different. <laughs> and lastly, condition. What's the condition of the property? Right. These are just things that you're collecting on that first call to qualify. Is this something you can even work with or not? Any questions so far? All right. All right, so the script opener. This, in my opinion, is the most critical part of the entire call. Who's ever heard the phrase, you only have the first three seconds to get the first 10 seconds? or something like that. I can never remember the, the exact terminology. It's true. And you gotta think about it. If you get a, a phone call from somebody in your initial you know, first three seconds, you get that initial alarm that this is someone trying to scam you or someone that you don't wanna waste your time on, you're gonna hang up on them. So this is that coffee shop opener. You know, you're sitting there, you're trying to spark up a conversation with somebody at a coffee shop. This is that initial building of trust and relationship. So whenever I'm training someone, I tell them, this is the only part of the script that you do not want to modify. You want to keep this almost word for word. Change this for your own liking, your own tonality. This is what works for me, right? Now, I stole this from somebody and I just modified it just to let you know. Who I stole it from, they started off with, hey, I'm looking for this person. I didn't like that because if I get a phone call, hey, I'm looking for Chris, my initial response is, who is this? Yeah, right. what, what are you talking about? Yeah, what, what is this for? So I thought to myself, well, hey, what if I'm calling my neighbor? Yeah, I got my neighbor over here. I'm calling my neighbor. And I'm like, oh, hey, yeah, I'm looking for John. This is John. Who the heck? You know who this is. I want them to think that we already know each other, right? So if I call my neighbor, well, first, I'm not going to call him John. I may call him something else. It's more derogatory. But I'm going to say a little bit different. I'm gonna say, hey, John, because it just comes off differently, right? 
I'm gonna pick up the phone, hey John. Now they're in mind thinking of, do I know this person? Am I aware of who this is? Okay, maybe I'm gonna start talking to them a little bit more. Now every time I have a, a break here, that's a pause. I'm gonna say, hey John, and then I shut the heck up. I don't say any other word. I wait for them to respond back to me, no matter what. Hey, I'm sorry, I know this call is just totally out of the blue or totally random, but I was calling about a property that I think you own over here on Main Street. Now, when I say that to them, what I'm actually doing is I'm slowing things down a little bit. I'm not sounding crisp and polished. I'm not going, oh, hey, yeah, I'm sorry, this is totally out of the blue, but I'm just calling about this property you have over here on Main Street. I'm not saying that. I'm slowing it down. I'm adding a little bit of pauses. Hey, John, <sighs> look, I'm sorry, this is just totally out of the blue or totally random, um, but I'm just calling about this property that I, I think you own uh, over here on Main Street, making it sound kind of questionable, right? I, maybe it's your house, maybe it's not. Because I want them to have the, the thought in their mind that maybe I'm just sitting in my truck, I just drove past the house, and I'm just calling, just, just giving them a call. And, you know, I'm not giving the full address. Yeah, over here at 123 Main Street, because now they know I'm looking at a computer screen and data. I don't want them to think that. You know, I want them to think that maybe I'm sitting down at Starbucks on my cell phone, even though I'm really sitting in my office with a headset on. I'm, I'm, it's these little pattern interrupts I'm trying to change. After they, add, they say, yeah, what about it? Or, no, that's not my house, but if they say, yeah, what about it? Well, hey, yeah, actually, I'm looking to actually buy something in the area and was really just curious if you guys had ever considered getting an offer on the property there. Now, the reason why this is structured this way is this word right here. Have you ever considered or considering getting an offer? I say considering because everyone would like to get an offer or they've thought about getting an offer, but they would never consider getting an offer. If you've ever considered it, it's just that weird thing that goes in your mind when you hear the word consider. Yeah, I've actually considered getting an offer for my property. They're, they're, in, that, they're in that mode. But again, after I say this, I shut up and I wait for them to say something back to me. Most of the time, it's a hang up. They just click, you move on to the next call. But sometimes they're like, yeah, what would you give me? But after you say this right here, there's really only six responses that they're gonna come back to you with. Who are you? How much will you give me? How did you get my number? I think I actually have this on the next slide here. Right here, yes, no, Maybe sometime in the future. How much will you give me? How'd you get my number? And who the hell are you? These are the six main responses that you'll receive on any cold call. There's actually seven, but this. Well, the seven was either F off or just click. They just hang up on you. They're, you know, it is what it is. If they hang up on you, you put them in as a no. I always mark that as a no. And then I just check back in, I follow back up with them three more times in the future. They just go back into a follow-up cycle. Because maybe they just weren't ready for me at that time. So we're gonna deep dive into all these really quick. Any questions so far? Am I going too fast? I have a question, but I'm sure it's probably gonna skip here. I don't wanna know where That's you fine. get these leads. Where do you get the leads? So I really wanna focus this more on the structure of the calls. If we have some time afterwards here in a little bit, I will kind of talk about where to get some of these leads. Yeah, but I was wondering why you, what is the criteria that we're looking for mm -hmm. to cornish this lead? Right. So we'll get into that if we have some time. All right. The grand finale. Yes. They said yes. I want an offer in my house. Now, they may not say yes. They may say something more like, how much would you give me? Yeah, I've considered getting an offer. But it's a yes, right? It allows you to move on to the next. This is like the pinnacle. How do you handle a yes response? Ah! Technology, man. It should be. All right, so they give you a yes response. At this point, I'm gonna then ask some questions talking about the, about the, uh, talking about the condition of the property because I'm gonna go into those four pillars of motivation. Right? So again, I'm gonna be kind of enthusiastic. Great. Well, hey, do you mind if I ask you a few questions, you know, about the condition, just so we get a, 
an, a better idea if we might be interested in this. I'm always kind of pulling back, right? Because again, I don't know much about the property. All I know is this was an address that was on my spreadsheet. I don't know anything about it. The last thing we want to do is come off super motivated, like, yeah, yeah, let me get, let, let, let's get you an offer, because that's going to push them further and further away. So I always pull back. Well, hey, look, do you mind if I ask you just a few questions about the property? You know, it's about the condition, just to see if we might be interested in this. I don't know if we are or not. I'm always kind of pulling away a little bit. Should only take about five minutes. Now, the reason why I say this right here, it should only take about five minutes, is because I'm trying to give them a timetable to work with, right? Because now they know, okay, it's only gonna take about five minutes. Okay, yeah, I can spare five minutes. But if I'm like, hey, can I ask you some questions? Well, how long, they're gonna think, how long is this gonna take? Am I gonna be here for half an hour, an hour? Look, I gotta get to work. I'm on my lunch break. I tell, I let them know it's only gonna take about five minutes. So this is how I took my first three seconds to the next 10 seconds, to now I got five minutes. As long as they gave me that five minute window. Now I got more time that they have approved to give to me on this call, right? So you're breaking down those barriers. Now the biggest thing I'm doing here, the net, from here on out, is I'm gonna ask broad, open-ended questions. So who, who's ever heard the, 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 the saying, the more you're talking, the more you're losing, or something like that? You wanna talk less. So if, you ever, if you're ever looking at your calls, and I don't know if you have a way of like watching like your uh, call metrics to see like who's talking or whatever, if you're looking at your calls, and I have all mine are recorded, so I can go back and see like the top line is me talking, bottom line is the seller talking. If my line is doing this and is bouncing like, around like crazy, that means I did something wrong. Because now that means I'm over talking. I want to be reversed. I want the seller talking like crazy and me talking maybe a couple words. I only wanna get a few words in and let them talk like crazy. So I ask them broad, open-ended questions that invokes them to tell me more. Because the more they talk, the more they tell me, the more trust they're building for me. So you can see these cold calls are all about building trust. It's all about building the relationship between the seller and you. So the more you get them talking to you, the more they, the more they will trust you. So I'll say, can you tell me a little bit more about the property? So right here, I actually stopped this right here. Can you tell me more about the property and then I'll stop. And that way I'm just saying, can you tell me more about it? If they start telling me, great. But a lot of times like, well, what do you want to know? You know, what, what can I tell you? Well, you know, like the beds, baths, square footage, you know, stuff like that. Open-ended. I'm leading them a little bit so they have a better idea. And then they're going to start word vomiting all over me. They're going to start telling me more about what's going on. They're going to tell me about the, the crappy foundation. They're going to tell me these things. If they start telling you about the bad stuff about the house, you got a good call. They're, they're willing to tell you there's bad stuff. If they're saying, oh yeah, it's in good shape, you know, maybe you need some paint, it's not too bad. You know, it's got four beds, three baths. You can find all this on Zillow. Oh yeah, yeah, Just, you never know Zillow data is not accurate, right? Have you done any major remodeling to the kitchen and the bathrooms in the last five years? As we all know as investors, that's probably where you're gonna put the most amount of money in your rehabs, kitchens, baths, roofs, foundations. So I start with that. Have you done any major remodeling in the last five years? Because, you know, trends change within five years. If they haven't, that means it's outdated. It needs to be updated. And then from here, you can start making your notes and start calculating your rehab costs. Got it? Awesome. All right. Now I'm going to ask about their situation. I'm going to ask about their motivation. Now, the last thing I'm going to do is I'm not just going to jump right out and say, well, hey, why are you motivated to sell this place? What's wrong? What's the problem? Somebody die? You know, I'm not going to say that. I want to build that friendship with them. But the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to sound confused. After they tell me about the condition of the house, I'm like, try to help me out here a little bit. This sounds like a really nice place. Why do you even want to sell it? Some reverse psychology, right? I'm trying to make them think of, oh, yeah, this place is nice. I really don't want to sell it. I'm trying to get them to tell me no. So that way I know I can get off the call, right? Sounds kind of weird, right? Because the more I can disqualify them, the closer I get to a qualified lead. Because if I'm talking to somebody for 10 minutes and they're talking about how their house is amazing and at the end of the call, yeah, I really didn't want to sell. I'm just trying to waste your time. 
I've had too many of those calls where people are like, I just, I really don't want to sell it. You're like the 50th person called me today, so I'm just fucking with you. Right? Sorry for the language, anybody. I apologize. But you get that. Right? They, people will waste your time. So I try to get them to a no. But here's the thing. If I say, this really sounds like a nice place, now they're going to combat me. Right? If the house isn't great, they're like, what are you talking about? I got a crater in the roof. My foundation is the Grand Canyon. This place sucks. That's why I want to sell it. My mom died in the kitchen from a heart attack. I have so many bad memories here. Please take this thing off my hands. I want them to beg me to, I want them to beg me to pull me in. Because again, now they're building that trust and relationship with me. Right? So I always say, it sounds like a great place. Even if it sounds like a total horror house, it sounds like a great place. All right, now price. So how do we get to the price question? What I always like to do is, now I don't know if we're gonna be able to be the best fit here. Again, I'm always pulling away, I'm always drawing back. I don't know if we're gonna be the best fit here. Did you by chance have an idea of what you're hoping to get for this property? A ballpark even, I'm not gonna hold you to it, right? And I may layer in a little bit on this end, just kind of saying, well, hey, look, you know, I haven't done any research on this just yet. I don't really have any numbers in front of me. You know, I don't really make the, 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 the determination. Uh, like I said earlier, I, I'm, I'm just the guy with the pretty voice and the ugly face who gets to make all the phone calls just to collect some information. My, you know, my wife, she really controls the purse strings and she makes all the real, real decisions around here. Even though my wife has no idea what I do in this business. They don't know that. But this right here, and I love this line, I won't hold you to it, even though I'm going to hold them to it. When you say that to somebody, they don't, they actually think you're not going to hold them to it. So they're, sometimes they're willing to come out and just say, well, hey, look, yeah, I'm looking to get around 80 grand for this place. They may tell you, 90% of the time, they're not going to tell you, right? Most of the time, they're probably going to say something to the score of, well, I don't know. I, I, I see Zillow has this thing for $300,000. Yeah, maybe I'll get something around that. Or you called me, you tell me. Right? How do you think we can combat that All right there? They say, you called me, you tell me. <coughs> what was that? Well, it depends. Are you doing things virtually or locally? For me, I'm not going to waste my time going to a house if I'm not even close. That's why we asked for the four pillars of motivation. Because if they're not motivated, why would I take that time to go to the house, right? So for me, it's always, well, hey, look, I don't know out the gate. I don't know these numbers out, off the gate here. I'm not going to set up an appointment with you. The purpose of the first call is to set up for the second call. The second call is where you really make the determination. Now, in my business, I do everything virtually. I never look at houses. I don't go to properties. I do everything all over the phone, right? Very, very small amount of time will actually go to a house. And that's basically like if the house is like five minutes from my office. If it's not five minutes from my office, I, I don't go to it. It's just, for me, I find it to be a waste of time, right? So I want to try to make these determinations out the gate. So my second call, that's where I'm going to call them back with some kind of offer, right? <clears throat> but if they say, well, hey, look, you call me, you tell me. Uh, honestly, I'm not sure. You're okay not to be polished on the phone. You're okay to tell these people, I really don't know. And it's weird how when you tell people you really don't know, again, you build better trust and relationship with them because you sound more like a human. Versus if they say, well, hey, you call me, you tell me, I go into Zillow and I take 50% off the Zillow and I just throw some number out there, right? So say Zillow says 300,000. Oh yeah, we're buying homes around your neighborhood around 150. They click on you, they hang up, right? That's why I don't give them an offer. I don't give them a number over the phone. I simply don't, right? Even if they don't give me a number here, if I can get price, great, that's wonderful. If I can't, I'm not too stressed about it. And again, I'm building the trust and building the relationship. So on my second call, when I call them back to do my offer presentation, that's when I can go into my whole song and dance. Or if someone's doing the calls for you, now you can pull your arsenal out and you can be your good salesperson to do everything you can to get that price as low as possible. But if you can get a price from the seller on the first call, nine times out of 10, you have an A deal on, on your hands if you get a good price from them. 
So let's say Zillow says it's 300 and they come back and say, honestly, I just need to get 50 grand out of this place. If I can get 50 grand, I'm good. Keep your emotions in check. Don't get too excited. Continue on the call. Timeline. Now timeline, this is where it's really, really pivotal because I've had so many people that'll tell me, well, hey, look, you know, our timeline, you know, we want to get this thing sold, but I got to wait for my daughter to finish high school. Oh, fantastic. When, when, when does she graduate? Oh, she's not born yet. <laughs> right. So she's not born yet. We, we haven't even conceived yet, you know, nothing like that. You know, so it, you want to make sure you follow, you follow these things because again, if they want to sell, and say they're super motivated, but they say their timeline's way far out there, you can't do anything with that. You can put them, you can put them into a follow-up and check back in with them, but if it's like year, two years, three years, they're gonna forget about you, you're gonna forget about them, and you're gonna probably move on, right? Put them into follow-up if they're motivated. If they've checked off on the other pillars of motivation, there's motivation there, check back in with them no matter what. But if they're kind of iffy on the motivation, house is in okay condition, the timeline's two years out, I may not waste my time. That's up to you. You can make that determination. But you're trying to figure out what's gonna be a hot lead. Now, if you have a lead manager or a VA or anything like that, have them follow up with you, with them. Have them check back in. And then only send it back over to you when they're ready to make a move. For me, if they, uh, um, if they wanna close in the next two weeks, that's a hot lead, let's get that moving. If they want to close in the next three months, let's get still a hot lead, let's get it moving, right? But you make that determination of what works best for your business. But timeline's critical because if they want to sell way too far in the future, you're wasting a lot of time. <clears throat> All right, so the ending of the call, now again, for me in my business, I do everything virtually. You can make the determination differently. If you want to go out and physically see the property, you want to make the appointment, this is where you're going to set up for the appointment. You know, hey, Thank you for all this. I've got all the information I need. Let me pass this on over to my partner for them to take a look at the numbers and see where we're going to be at. When would be a good time for us to come take a look at the property? You know, later today between one and two are good for you, or is tomorrow tomorrow morning better for you? What works better? I always, if the, if that is the event I want to go see the property, I always give them options of when I can go take a look at it, versus saying when would you be available for me to take a look at the house? Because if you leave it open ended they're not gonna give you a real time. I always give them options. Tomorrow between two and three, or today between one and two, or whatever the case may be. They may counter it back at a different time, that's okay. But for me, I rack it up for a second call. It's always a second call for me. So hey, I got all the information I need here, let me pass this on over to my partner for them to really run their numbers. Like I said, they're more the numbers, per the more the numbers guy, they make more of the decisions on that end. And I'll either he or myself will give you a call back a little bit later, later today to give you a call uh, to talk about our options. Any questions? All right. I will say the end of the call is just as important as the beginning of the call because you're racking it up for the second step. Because the second step is where you really dig into your sales process. So you can mess this, changes around a little bit as far as to meet your criteria if you're doing an in-person versus virtual or whatever works best for your personality. And that's why you wanna take my script here more with a grain of salt. You wanna change it to mesh your personality. Because the way I handle a call is gonna be a thousand percent different than the way you're gonna handle a call, right? You may talk to them a little bit differently. You wanna spice it up a little bit. You wanna put in your little personality. Make it personal, make it your own, right? Any questions? Nobody? Anybody asleep? Bored? Anybody so excited to get on a cold call? Everybody? All right, pull your phones out. I'm kidding. <clears throat> All right, so rebuttals. So with the, the six different things you're going to get on any kind of call, they're going to add, they're, these are the rebuttals they're going to give back to you. How did, how did you get my number? And this is what scares the most people off. And I've heard this so many weird times. How did you get my number? Oh, I Googled you. You Googled me? I'm on Google? What? That scares people, right? I looked you up online. No. 
you A, you want to validate. That's a great question, right? You want to let them know, hey, it's a great question. I get that all the time. We use an online service called LexisNexis. We don't, but people are aware of what they think of. They know what LexisNexis is, so they just associate it. We send them a list of properties that we might be interested in, and they send us back possible phone numbers, and sometimes we get lucky. Right, I pass up somebody else. Ah, really, I don't know. I mean, we just we use an online service, LexisNexis. Yeah, we give them a list of properties that we have some interest in. They kick us back a bunch of phone numbers, and sometimes we get lucky. You never know. Some people will try to go into the whole weeds of, oh yeah, have you ever done a credit card application? Have you ever gone and signed up for one of those free cruises at the mall? Like they'll go into this whole thing. Like why? Oh, like how their number got into the system. Or right. Something. Like why? Why go into all that? Like, I I don't know how it all works. I just know that's what we do, and we get lucky. Make it easy. Who are you? For me, I don't like coming off as this professional sounding, hey, I'm Chris with one, two, three, home buyers, da 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 da. One thing I found weird, I don't know if this is just the Texas thing or if this is kind of a global thing, people don't like working with big companies. I don't know what it is. They like dealing with that homegrown guy down the road. They like they, local people, right? They really like dealing with local people. So, hey, yeah, my name's Chris. I don't give me any kind of company name. You know, my partner and I were just a couple, uh, a couple of home buyers, or just a couple of guys looking to do some tasteful remodels in the area. Just a regular guy, right? Because they trust me better that way. They can't go Google me. They can't go to my BBB and see that I have an F plus rating or whatever that is. You know, they can't see any of that because I'm not some company, right? I'm just some guy. Why that is? People just trust it better. What's your offer? This is my favorite question. What's your offer? Because again, you don't want to give a number on the first call. That I don't know just yet. I don't know. I haven't even seen the house. How can I make you an offer on something I haven't even seen? Do you mind if I ask you a few questions? This is where I'm taking their question and I'm throwing it right back at them with that another question of, well, I, I'm not sure yet. Do you mind if I ask you some more questions to carry the conversation forward, right? This is how you keep control of the call, by you asking a question to them and them not asking questions to you. So you want to ask, give them a little bit of information, ask them a question, carry the conversation forward. But do you mind if I ask you a few questions to see what offer we might be able to make if we're able to? I'm always, just, I'm layering that in with them every single time. I don't know if I can buy your house. I don't know if I'm going to be your best solution. We may not be able to buy your house. I'm always pulling back, pulling back, because the more I pull away from them, and if they're seriously motivated, they're going to latch onto me and pull me forward towards them. If, they have, if I have them pull me forward towards them, I know I have a hot lead on my hands. I'm on the do not call list. Take me off your list. No problem. I'm so sorry. I'll remove you immediately. Do not fight this. If you want to fight this, go right ahead. If you want to be charged, what is like $20,000 per attempt or something like that, not worth it. So there is a. Mm -hmm. Right. So there is a national do not call registry. Every all the lists that we take, we do scrub them against the federal do not call registry, as well as our own internal do not call it registry, as well as a litigator registry. So we have a few things that we go through because there are people who are professional litigators. And you want to be careful with that. And there's a few, a few tools over there where you can scrub your list against litigators to make sure that you don't get any of those people. So we do scrub our lists with the Do Not Call registry. But you get a lot of people who think they're on the Do Not Call list. Because they've asked to be. They've yes. Been, I've told people, um, you know, hey, put me on the Do Not Call list. But they've never actually gone and mm -hmm. exactly. registered. Right, or they've registered with an old phone number and then this is a different phone number. They think it globalizes. But again, I'm not going to fight it. Because again, if I get pushed back here, there's going to be rude and mean to me. Am I going to have an opportunity of building any kind of relationship with that person? Why waste my time? I'll never do a deal with that person, ever. So, hey, I am so sorry. I have egg on my face. I'll take you off immediately. Have a great day. I'm not going to fight them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So how do you, how do you respond to that? Like, give me your last name so I can, you know. 
Yeah. Yeah. My, my name's Chris Gibbons. Do you mind if I ask why? Or no, no, yeah, my name's Chris Gibbons. Uh, curious. I mean, when would she ask that question? I don't know. How, I have no problem. I'm not hiding behind anything. I just don't give my company name. Oh. Right? Yeah. Why hide? Because the more you sound deceitful, the more they're not going to like you. The more they're not going to trust you. I want to build trust with them. Do you have a question? Yeah. What are some of the services that you do for your agents <coughs> or navigators? Mm -hmm. Right. So with our skip tracing that we use, they automatically checks against the do not call list. Okay. And our dialer also checks the federal do not call list. So it's kind of like a double verify with the, both the dialer and our, our uh, skip tracer. And then our skip tracer also does litigation checks as well. So it's all just bundled up in one. Then we'll, we'll show that in a minute if we have time. All right, any questions here? Have you ever had anyone take it further than they've asked you, like seriously threaten to do something about it? Or? Yeah. Well, hey, no, not a problem at all. I appreciate your time. Thank you. I, I do some texting, and I had one that said that um, they were going to, they, now they're in pre foreclosure, so they don't have enough money to pay their mortgage. <laughs> and they said, I'm going to send your number to my lawyer for a SMS lawsuit. Mm -hmm. That be prepared, they said. And I said, yeah. put them on my do not call list. Didn't reply. Just put them off my list yeah. and went about my day because they're not, they're not doing anything. They can't no. afford their house. They're not paying a lawyer exactly. for an SMS lawsuit. Especially if you come to them with just Instead of being a bully, and this is the big thing, you don't want to be a bully on these calls. If you're not going to be a bully, you just come and say, well, hey, look, I totally understand where you're coming from there. You're more than welcome within your rights to do that, uh, and I'm not going to fault you for that. I'll go ahead. I'll take you off our list here, and I'll make sure I don't call you ever again. Right? So if you say that to them, now they realize, okay, maybe he's not too much of a dick. When, right? But as soon as they hang up that call, they probably have their kids screaming at them, and they just, again, they forgot about you. They're not going to do anything about it for the most part. You will have the professional litigators who will. That does happen. So like with any kind of marketing or any kind of business, you still want to make sure you have some kind of legal representation that you can always forward things over to just to cover your own butts. That's not anything you do. But if you're terrified of having potential lawsuits or potential uh, people coming after you these things, why are you even in business? Right? I mean, I think it was a saying that someone said to me once. You're not truly in business until somebody's put a lawsuit against you. I think that's right. It's not about. I haven't been there yet, so I'm not really in business. Yeah. <laughs> Knock on some wood there. <laughs> not that I know of. I've had Trek. I've had Trek complaints. But that's between Angie and me. Now, um, so some of your stuff says, you know, oh, it doesn't involve any realtors, all that stuff. But you're a right. licensed realtor, right? Right. So at some point you're required to disclose that information. So do you... I'm required to disclose it if I'm going to represent them. Uh, or do you disclose that you're a realtor mm -hmm. if you're... If I'm offering any kind of... On the contract, I do. Okay, so you only disclose... You don't ever verbally disclose it to them. You just put it on the... On I will. The I, I do let... I do... I will say that I am... I do hold a license, a real estate license in Texas. Because I... You as an investor are not... Yeah, right, exactly. All right, I'll say that to them because I want, again, I use it as a, as a trust factor, right? right? Yeah. So it's like, hey, like I'm a licensed realtor. I'm not, gonna, I'm not representing you in any way, but I'm not required to verbally say it. Okay. We do have to disclose it, but that's on the truck contract. Okay, so that's, okay. Yeah, but yeah, you, know, you don't have to ever say it unless you are offering services. Okay. And that can, get, that can get really meshy sometimes if I'm trying to call as a buyer and I mention, I mention I'm a realtor, immediately like, oh, no, you're trying to list my home. Oh, yeah. So I don't usually right. mention it until we've developed a relationship of some sort. There's actual, right. like, a lot of back and Exactly. Back. And then, yeah, I don't ever mention it up front. It's usually very mm -hmm. much later when we're actually maybe discussing contract or yep. heading in that direction. Exactly. And I'm like, just so you know, I am a licensed realtor. I'm not talking to you as a realtor yep. today. Mm -hmm. I'm talking to you as, you know, a buyer. I'm right. Just, I'm just letting you know that I am. Yeah, and that's exactly when I would do it as well. I'm not going to do it on the initial call because no, 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 no. the initial call, this is just fielding. All this is all it is is a process of disqualification. Mm -hmm. I'm disqualifying this potential lead or this prospect as a lead to then move on to the next step. Once I'm on the next step, 
that's when I go into my whole sales process. Any more questions? All right. So the biggest takeaway from all the responses and the rebuttals all comes down to maintaining control of the conversation. Anytime they give you a question, they, they give you some kind of rebuttal, give them a little bit of information, but then always follow it up with a question to carry it on forward every single time. All right. This is probably the most frequent one you're going to get. I'm not selling or no, right? And this is okay. I'm okay getting a no out the gate because there's actually been times I will call someone about their personal home that maybe they just bought. No, I don't want to sell this at all. We love this place. I'm going to you know, be buried in the backyard here, right? I'm okay with that. Most of my deals that I've gotten from cold calls actually came from this right here where they sell, told me no. And it's because I'll say, no worries at all. Do you by chance have any other properties that you might consider selling? Something that needs a little bit of work, land even. Because maybe they're not even thinking, I'm thinking about land. I'm not thinking about buying vacant infill lots, right? They, they don't know about that. I bought 15 and a half acres in Waco that we sold for one and a half million dollars off that one question, right? Now, given I didn't get it for that good of a deal, it's still an okay deal, but still. I was calling this guy about his homestead house that he was never considered selling, but he had this piece of land that they've been sitting on for 20 years, didn't know what to do with it. That question alone is the most powerful question you're gonna have because they don't even think about it unless you ask. Any questions on the no? All right. Now, after they say this, they say no, you ask if they have anything else, if they still say they don't have anything, hey, not a problem at all, thank you for your time. There's no need to really carry on the conversation, kind of kill at that point. But I will always throw them into a follow-up funnel and check back in with them at least three to four more times throughout the next year. Because maybe I caught them at the wrong time. Maybe right now they got inundated with a bunch of other calls from other investors or realtors or debt collectors. Or you just caught them after they just had a terrible conversation with their husband or wife or whatnot. Or maybe now their aunt's ready to sell. Right. Or someone else that they know is ready to sell. So always check back in with them. All right. Disposition. So this is just at the end of every call, the dispositions. And this is how you kind of keep track of what the next step is going to be with these people. You have, <laughs> I try to keep it as basic as possible. Instead of having like where... In some of these dialing platforms, you can do like 20 different dispositions for different things to do whatever. I keep it easy. Yes, no, maybe, cash buyer. How many cash buyers do you think you can add to your wholesale distribution list by talking to see people on cold calls? A lot. How, think about it. Say you pull a tire landlord list. That's a big one. And they're like, well, no, I'm not selling anything. I'm actually looking to buy more. I've added so many new buyers to my, dis my dispo list just from cold calling because I talk to other landlords or investors or even realtors who want to buy more properties. So I, that's a new one I just added not too long ago. But keeping these buckets, yes, obviously as a hot lead, you're going to follow up with them immediately, whether you went on an appointment with them or you're going to call them back later, that's a hot lead. No, you're going to check back in with them three to four more times until they tell you to go do something nasty to yourself. Maybe, maybe sometime in the future, maybe I'll sell it in six months, in a year. Just put them in a maybe bucket and just check back with them every 30 days. Every 30 days, I'm just checking back in with these guys because maybe now is the, now is the right time. Does anyone else have anything that anyone's they would add to this list? All right, cool. All right. This is everyone's favorite part, role-playing. Not the kind you're thinking of. But who wants to be my dummy? Who wants to, who wants to be my, my, my two pair to come up here and role-play? All right, got one? No, one, one more. All right, let's go. All right, who wants to flip a coin? Who's, this, who's seller, who's the caller? Yeah. Uh, I don't have a coin. I say let's flip a coin. I'm bad at this. All right. 
<laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. All right, here. We're going to be caller, okay. seller. All right, don't make it easy on him. All right. All right, so you're going to take a moment? Yeah, you're going to need the script. <laughs> that, that was good that was good that was good that was good all right all right yeah i think you're you you were that was about 90 percent of your calls right there i say more 80 percent the, the other ones are going to be more like hang up they're going to call you nasty things they're going to curse at you right exactly you're finding that one person that you can really talk to all right, so that, pointers. What are that all right, so some pointers you want to work on. So A, when you're, when you're first opening it up, like, again, you want to have just a natural conversation with someone, right? So you're trying to build that relationship with them out, out the gate. So, hey, Rebecca. Oh, okay. Um, hi, uh, who is this? Hey, yeah, my name's Chris. And, hey, I'm sorry. I know this is just totally random. Um, but I was calling about this property I think you own over on Main Street. Main Street. Okay, great. Well, hey, like my, my partner and I, we're, we're looking to possibly buy something in the area, and I was really just curious if you'd ever considered getting an offer on that place there. Well, I'm not really interested in selling. Uh-huh. Okay. Not a problem at all. I mean, do, do you happen to have any other properties you might consider selling? Maybe something's a little bit of work, land even? Other properties, but uh -huh. they're rentals, and okay, pretty happy with them. Oh, okay, cool, cool. Well, hey, look, I mean, if anything ever changes, uh, do you do you mind saving my number? I mean, we're always looking for for something. Okay, sure. Okay, cool. Appreciate it. Now, at this point, what I do is I always tell them to save my number as Rebecca Investor. Yeah. That way, when they're like, "What's that lady? That investor lady I was talking to? You search investor, you find me." Yeah. I always tell them, "Save my name as Rebecca mm -hmm. Investor." That's perfect. I love that. Yeah. And I, I, I tend to forget that a lot of the yeah. times too, but it's true. Most of the time they're not going to save you in their phone you're that way. Name, right. What to tell them? Give them instructions. Right. Yeah. Tell them exactly what you want from them. It's like, hey, save me in, in your phone as Chris buys ugly homes or Chris, the home buyer, something of that nature. If anything changes, give me a call. Forget about everybody else. Give me a call because be, I'll be your best friend. I, I have terrible a sense of humor. Yeah, we're good. Am I gonna try again? Yeah, no, if you want to try again, you can. No, that's all right. Okay. All right. I'll be nicer. In a month. Question? I'll try again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, actually, that, that's another point. Sorry, we'll get to your question here in a second. I have a question. I was wondering, did you miss an opportunity? She said she had a couple of rental properties. So I could have dove deeper into that. Right. But she said that she's happy with them, right? Because I've already asked her if she has anything she would consider selling. But she says she already has a few rental properties. Like, okay, great. Well, if she's happy with them, I'm not going to dig deep. But an opportunity I could have had is ask, well, are you looking to buy any more? Right. There you go. That's probably your question. Right. So I could have done that. Right? Very good point. Um, but no, to kind of capitalize what you were saying. Now, a few of the pointers I would have, I'm not going to tell them at the end. I'll check back with you in a, few, in a month. Right? Because you're just going to piss them off a little bit right there. So like, hey, not a problem. Thank you for your time. Just, just move on from there, and you will follow up with them. But by telling them that you're going to follow back up with them in a month, you're just going to piss them off, and they may try to flag you as some kind of spam yeah, number. Like, no, please don't. Take me off your list. 
Right. Now you could disqualify, but again, you found maybe caught him at that wrong time, come at a bad moment. So you just want to try to get away from that. Now, the other points too is you want to you want to be more conversational, right? You just want to make it sound like a natural conversation. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to have quality conversations with these homeowners and not just rapid fire questions, not just this professional <laughs> interrogation. It's a nice conversation we're trying to have with them. So when she was asking you, hey, how did you get my number? I don't know, someone just gave me a list. Oh, who's this person? What, 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 how's my number on some list, right? Well, hey, that, that's a great question. I mean, uh, really, we use this online service called LexisNexis. I try to make everything kind of sound kind of questionable. It's like, uh, LexisNexis, maybe I'm trying to think of it. Yeah, we, we, we send them a list of properties that we may be interested in, and then they spit us back out a bunch of numbers, and you know, sometimes I get lucky, right? It, it says the ease a little bit better, but if you just tell somebody, yeah, someone gave me a list. <laughs> Who is it? Is it the mafia? Are we... <laughs> Are, are we dealing with the Bratva in Russia? I mean, what, what's going on here, right? So they're going to start questioning more and more, and your credibility goes down, right? So you want to just sound natural. And, you know, for me, again, I always like to layer in a bunch of bad, poor dad jokes. This is what I do. But the more you, for me, the way I like to do this is the more I can get someone to laugh on the phone, the more trust and relationship that I build with them. But that's just because I have a bad sense of humor. Question? Yeah. Yeah. Let's. Are you up for that? Let's do it. All right. Yeah. Not a problem. My calls. You know, I actually don't have necessarily an opening script because I mm -hmm. call different. Um, I have different types of leads. So depending on the type of lead, I might approach it slightly differently. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I'm calling somebody that maybe is on a probate list or something like that. That's a little bit so different. My tone is a little bit different. It's a little more like consoling. It's like, oh, okay, you know, yeah, I, know that, I know this is probably a sensitive mm -hmm. subject, but I was just calling to see, you know, what what your plans were for the property. So it's a, it's a, it's a different approach. Yeah, but, um, it's a little bit different. Mostly I'm calling like pre-foreclosure type stuff, so mm -hmm. I can just do that. Yeah, no, that's fine. And it, it, it depends. For me, I like cadence, consistency and cadence. So I'll use the same script for everything. And that's just because it, it just it rolls off the tongue at this point. Uh, and for the most part, this script is kind of generic enough, but I like your approach with certain probate owners because for the most part, when you're calling someone on probate, the name I have on here is like Mary Ellis, and maybe I'm talking to their son, Chad. Yeah. You know, I'm not... Which is often the one listed. Right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So I'm not talking to the actual decedent, and that's, that's the biggest problem right there. It's like, well, yeah, well, they had this property. It's not your property. It sometimes gets confused. But the biggest thing there, and you kind of just trigger this in my mind, is when you're talking to these people, you want to mirror and match the person you're talking to. Have you ever heard of that before, mirroring and matching? So for me, like you want to have a good, like upbeat, kind of more natural personality. But at the same time, if you get someone on the phone who's just really harsh, old, West Texas guy, you know, yeah, yeah, what do you want here? You want to match that personality, right? Because if they're going to be rough, you got to be a little rough. Uh, so, and I'll do, when I get an older gentleman like that, I do a lot of, oh, yes, sir, yes, sir. Yep, I exactly. the way I respond to him, I do. Yeah, you want to be more abrupt. Or if they're softer, kinder, old grandma, you know, a little slower. Last thing I want to do is talk really, really fast to her about hey, what's going on, how can we help you. Hey, yeah, can you talk to me a little bit more about you know, what's going on? Yeah, how, how can we help you, right? You want to mirror and match that personality. And that kind of works the same way with the probates. Because if you're talking to a probate, most of the time, depending on how long the probate process is taken, they're still grieving. They're in that process. So for the most part, they're going to be, uh, yeah, and making it by. So you want to kind of slow that down and come from that area of service. So yeah, let's go right ahead. So I guess you're the caller and I'll, I'll be the, the seller. Uh, hello? Yeah, who's this? Hey, Chris, this is Rebecca. Uh-huh. Um, I know this call's pretty out of the blue, uh -huh. but I was just 
just call in to see, um, I think you own a property on Main Street. Uh, yeah. What is this about? Well, that's a great question. Um, I'm calling because uh, my husband and I were looking for a couple of houses in mm -hmm. that area. And we saw your house and we thought it would be a great house to, um, to purchase. So I was just curious, have you considered selling that property? What, what makes you think my house is good for you to purchase? Uh, the area is really nice, and uh -huh. my husband and I, we um, we're looking for a couple of good properties that we can renovate. Okay. And um, I was just calling to see if you thought uh, if you had considered an offer on your property. I mean, everything's for sale for the right price. That is very true. Very true. Well, um, what's the right price? Uh, you called me. I you, did call you. You you, you, you tell me. Very good. Well, you know, I don't really know. Um, I would have to do a little bit of um, research on your particular property. Okay. Um, do you have time to answer a few questions right now? It's going to take a couple minutes. I mean, yeah, sure. What, what do you need to know? Well, I was just curious about the overall condition of your property. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Uh, yeah. I mean, the place is fantastic. We, we bought it. Oh, my, me, my, my, my grandparents bought it back in the 50s when it was brand new. Um, really nice place when they bought it. It's been fantastic. I mean, we, we put some new paint on it, so it's been renovated, yeah. Now, do you have inside or outside paint? Uh, yeah. Okay, great, great, excellent. So, tell me, has the, has the kitchen or bathrooms, have they been updated recently, or are they mm -hmm. fairly original? I mean, yeah. I mean, we, we put some new appliances in there. New yeah, yeah, we, we did we did that when we moved in in um yeah two thousand one. Two thousand one appliances. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Yeah. So the countertops are they still pretty original or have y'all changed those out? You can change those out. <laughs> yeah, some people they like to. Um, so the countertops and cabinets they're pretty they're original to the mm -hmm. house. Uh yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the flooring, have y'all ever changed the flooring in the kitchen? Is it still the same original 1950s flooring? Yeah, we love that linoleum. It's just, it's really nice. It's bomb, bomb proof. Oh, it, it is, man. That yeah. holds up to everything. Yeah, it peels up a little bit. Just cut your foot if you're walking around barefoot, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. Thank you for that. Yeah. 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 You, you, you had your tetanus shot, right? <laughs> and in the bathroom. Have y'all done any remodeling in there or updating, or are they still, um, let's see, in the 50s, do you, are, is it pink, or? Yeah, no, my, my grandma, she loved green, the so green. it's that green, that, that beautiful green color. We've, we've cleaned the toilet, so definitely it's been updated, yeah. Clean, did you just say clean the toilet? <laughs> hey, that, that's a bonus for some of these houses, I, I tell you. <laughs> We like to keep it classic. Yes, classic. <laughs> so, do we, I mean, are we going to keep going? <laughs> I mean, this is fun. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't know if maybe you kind of got what you needed from, but basically, I try not to be, like, if they're being, yeah. you know, genuine, and it's obviously negative features, I don't turn it too negatively. Mm -hmm. Now, we'll talk about that again later, yeah. about how when we talk more numbers, we'll discuss how, well, you know, to get top market value, you're going to need to do these updates because yep. you do have all original 1950s flooring, cabinet, right. wiring, plumbing, mm -hmm. all of the things. But you don't want to get into that on the first call. Right. That's the biggest thing. Positive, yeah. and just kind of let them talk to you about, you know, and so it's, yeah. Yeah. No, I love that. Thank you so much. All Thank right. you. But you know, the, the biggest takeaway there is you really want to focus on the first call. You're, you're discovering, right? You're asking broad, op broad open-ended questions. Now, she was leading me a lot because I wasn't really being that helpful. But the biggest things that I would like to do is I ask that broad, open question. Well, hey, can you tell me a little bit more about the property? You know, what, what can you tell me about it? That way it allows them more time to open up and them to talk to me. And if they're not going to talk to me, I'll give them some leads, right? Well, hey, look, can you, you know, like the beds, the baths, have you done any major remodeling? You know, stuff like that. 
that way it's just an open-endedness that just brings all that stuff out of them. And if I get a talker on my hands, I'm gonna let them keep talking. I'm gonna give them all the time of the day if it's leading us forward to the call. But if they're just gonna start talking to me about how their grandchildren's going off to college and how they made them this beautiful thing, I'm gonna to try to redirect. dial, redirect back to them. That's where I use my script to try to redirect back to that. Uh, or I'll say, well, hey, man, I'm so sorry. I actually have another appointment I gotta to get to. Do you mind if I ask you about this? Go back to my script, grab my next bullet point, and try to direct them back on point a little bit to try to carry the conversation forward. Because you will get people who will just totally snake away your time, whether because maybe it's just a good old grandparent who doesn't hasn't have a lot of people to talk to, and you sound like a good person, they want to talk to you, so they'll talk your ear off. Or they will legitimately be time vampires who will want to waste your time because you're wasting their time. So you got to kind of weed that out a little bit. I have been that conversation with mama for literally like four hours. I was just like, what are you doing? This guy is not, I, and it's someone that I had previously talked to, and he was very litigious. Mm. And I was like, oh, I'll get off the phone. Oh, yeah. That happen often. You find people you can set up <coughs> just to mess with you. Yep. I made this joke a few times about the person doing, uh, doing goat sacrifices in the backyard. That's legit. I had a lady who I talked to. It's like, yeah, our neighbors are just, they really want us gone. We, we want to get out of here. I mean, we're, we're, we're Muslim. We're very religious. And we, we hold goat sacrifices in the backyard. And it sounds like we're murdering kids in the backyard. So our neighbors are just, they want us gone. And she kept me going. She kept me going good. Yeah. Um, she was like, oh, yeah, we had to go to a hotel because of the rats and the cockroaches. And I was like, okay, okay, that, that's not, like, I understand, okay. Sounds like a winner, yeah. Right, and I was like, great, you know, tell me. And, and then she kept going, and she was like, oh, yeah, the raccoons and the possums and the ants. And I said, wait, do you have any foxes? And she said, oh, yeah, foxes. <laughs> See, you that well, yeah, you, you should. It was like, oh, hey, look, oh, shoot, I have another call coming in. Let me call you right back. <laughs> Click, do not call. Yeah. Right, you want to get off that call as fast as possible. Um, but yeah, no, that's fantastic. And this is, these are the things you won't pick up on if you just hire someone to do the calls for you. Mm -hmm. You simply won't. Because if you start listening, like if you start listening back to their calls that someone you hire does, and you hear these things, you can coach someone how to direct from it, how to find those little keywords, how to find those triggers, so that way they don't run into them. The other problem with hiring cold callers, and this is why I don't like just hiring services to do my cold calling for me, is A, they don't sound natural. You could tell they're just calling from a call center. For the most part, again, they probably hired people in the Philippines for $2 an hour, and they're just given the script, and they're just robotically going through. They may have a good lead that could be great, and they're just chucking it in the trash. Or they'll talk to somebody, the person told them no a thousand times, and they still send you the lead no matter what. It's just not good. And you can't even manage those people either if you hire them through a service. Like you have no real direct interaction with them. So you want to do the calls yourself, hire your own callers, and teach them yourself on how to cold call versus having them learn from somewhere else. And that's the other thing. If I have someone that I hire who has cold calling experience, I don't hire them. I they, already have bad habits. they already have bad habits. So call yourself, have at least 1,000 quality conversations, and then look at hiring. All right, couple tips. Keep calm, be personal, don't ignore the haters, and stay consistent. People will hate you on the phone. People will call you nasty names. You will be threatened. You will be anything. This person's on the other side of the phone call. They can't reach through and Bart Simpson me. They simply can't. If they want to throw names, they want to threaten, whatnot, I'm using a dummy number they can't trace. I hang up, dump the lead, I move on. Right? Biggest thing though is be consistent. You can't make five calls today and say that it doesn't work. You have to be calling for a minimum three hours a day and have 30 conversations a day to get any kind of progress. And I'm talking about 30 conversations with homeowners, not just people who pick up and say, you got the wrong number. All right, so you need to stay consistent every single day. That's your target, 30 a day? 30 a day, minimum. 30 conversations? 30 conversations with homeowners. So is there 
better to get that Google number, and then once you establish mm -hmm. a better relationship with them, give them your personal number so they'll know who mm -hmm. you are. Yeah. So I don't use Google numbers anymore. So depending on what dialing, like power dialer you use, if you use a power dialer, uh, with those you can buy banking numbers from them that you can rotate through the phone numbers. And then when I call them on the second call, I call them with my actual number. I never use my personal cell phone, period. Like my personal cell phone's like an old Utah phone number. I never changed it over the last 10 years. So my personal cell phone number, Personal cell phone never gets used. I use a, a call roll phone number so I can track all my numbers, all my calls. Call rail. Call rail. Call rail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of services out there like that. All right, so just to kind of go over the the tips, the software and lists and whatnot. How are we doing on time? Maybe it's eleven. All right, so we got six minutes. Let's get through this real fast. It says 11.30. It says 11.30? Am I blown through time? You got another 36 minutes. Wow. Yes. I'm always, like, breaking for time here. All right, uh, software, this is just, again, we've kind of gone over the basics of the, the cold call and whatnot. This is just some tools that we use. Uh, so for a dialer, Mojo Sales is probably the oldest dialer in, this, in the uh, world. This is very heavily tailored towards realtors. In my opinion, is the most stable. I, I have used all these tools. I have gone back and forth between using these tools left and right, at left, right, and center, and I always go back to Mojo Dialer every single time. It is a triple line dialer, meaning that you can call three lines at a time. And why that's important is say if you have a list of 5,000 numbers to call, if you were to pick up your phone and try dialing, 5,000 numbers, you'd only get through maybe 10. You wouldn't get through very many if you're like manually dialing each one of these. But the Mojo Dialer, Call Tools, Zen Call, Batch Dialer, you load your list up into a campaign, you go in there, you click Start, and it will start dialing in the background. Whoever picks up first will then load, will, batch, will patch that call right into you, and they'll dump the rest of the calls. And then it'll, after that call is over, you leave your notes in the system like a normal CRM, and it starts dialing again, going to the next. So you can really power through. So it'll dial three lines at a time until someone actually patches into your call. Fairly simple to set up. Really easy to set up. Very, very easy. Mojo is probably the easiest to set up. The, and again, it's the easiest, it works the best. The way theirs works is you have to dial into a bridge. So you'll dial into their bridge from your normal phone and then you'll start making your calls. Other ones like Call Tools, then Call and Batch Dialer, they have a built-in soft phone where it's all through the web browser and you have to have a really solid internet connection or else it just falls apart. But I like Mojo Sales the best because I could actually, probably shouldn't have been doing this and I wish I found the photo, so hilarious. I had my iPad propped up in my truck and I had to commute from Alito to Dallas and that's like an hour, hour and a half drive sometimes from Alito to Dallas. I had to do that every day so I had my iPad propped up right here, had my AirPod in my ear, and I would make my cold calls driving down the road because it just works that well. Uh, but these other tools are great too. Call Tools is another great one. Uh, Batch Dialer is probably one of the more popular ones right now uh, through Batch Leads and all their services. Good tools, tons of configuration. They need a lot of configuration to really dial in how your campaigns are set up, but can be very powerful. The, the phone is built into the web browser, so you have to have a headset that connects to your computer, and you need to have a landline, uh, not landline, but a hardline ethernet connection to your computer. You don't wanna run on Wi-Fi, or else again, it just has a lot of problems. <clears throat> my phoner, I don't know if this is even a, a system anymore, but basically my phoner, it's not an auto dialer, it's more just like a CRM where you can load up your contacts list and you just can manually like click to the next contact, but you still have to dial them manually. It's an option, it's free, or it's like free or 30 bucks a month or something like that, it's really cheap, just to kind of keep track of your contacts if you needed that. I wouldn't recommend it though. Call rail is what we use for our phone numbers. So what that means is that if I'm calling out with cold calls, one problem you're gonna have when making cold calls is if you call so many numbers in a rapid amount of time, the mobile carriers have started to really catch in on that. And so you never know, you get that 
you know, spam likely or scam likely on your phone, it's because it's these people who are just burning out these phone numbers using these auto dialers. So we use call rail to get us a batch of a few phone numbers. So it's not using my personal cell phone number or even my business phone number. It's using just some random number that I generated for that day or that week. So it's just a random number that we have set up. We dial with that number using call rail. All the calls get tracked back into call rail, which then goes into our CRM system. So they call us back, they get a voicemail, it goes to our CRM. They text us back, it goes to our CRM. So that's what's really nice about call rail is it's all trackable, all calls are recorded if you have that feature turned on. What do you start thinking about like how long do you think it keeps like running your people there? So I'm bad with that. I dump them almost immediately. Okay. So ideally you would probably want to keep it for at least a month or two just to really kind of make sure because most for the most part no one's going to call you back after three four months uh and most and if i have a good conversation with somebody i always give them my personal number or not my my business personal number my direct i always say hey let me give you my personal cell phone number is the i'm the easiest to reach at that so i'll give them my my business number which is again it's a virtual number but i give them that but it builds more credibility So there are services that you could pay for where you can go in there and it will check. Huh? You can whitelist them. You can whitelist them, but that still only works for so long. Whitelisting immediately is a big deal because if you get a new number through CallRail, it will almost immediately show a spam. Just immediately will. You can register all your phone numbers. There's a free service you can go. I can't remember the website right now where you can register all your phone numbers to not show up as spam or scam or anything like that but they will burn out over time. So we're cycling out our numbers at least once a week because it's going through and it'll burn them out really quick. So that's why you want to make sure you're monitoring it. One way we monitor it, there are services you can pay for. You can go in there and it'll flag and say, hey, this number's showing a spam. Another way is I just Google the phone number. I just go into Google, put the phone number in, and if in the top results is showing scam call, robo call, I'll just dump the number. So that's what's really nice about call rail. You can just go in, deactivate a phone number, go start up a new phone number, and you're good to go. Within a matter of five seconds. Now you said once you're on the call, right? And you just start to the next step. You said you have a personal number. Is that like a VIN number? So, I, yeah. <laughs> it's a VoIP number. So I use a service called Dialpad. There's like Ring Central, Dialpad. You can even use call rail and just set up a, a phone number just for yourself to use. Uh, but I use a service called Dialpad. It's like 30 bucks a month or something like that. And it's just a business phone system, but it all routes to my cell phone, so I'm not having to carry around two phones. Does it use voicemails? I do. There's a controversy around voicemails. Uh, people will say voicemails aren't necessary, don't leave voicemails. We'll get to that. So Mojo, I can just do an auto drop. So I have a pre-recorded voicemail that if I get to a voicemail box, I push a button, it drops an automatically pre-recorded voicemail. There is a setting for that. Really? Yep. I need to know about this. Yes. It's actually, by default, it should already be turned on, but if you go into your settings, there is a wait for beep option that you have to untoggle, okay. and then it will actually it will do the waiting for you. <clears throat> but a lot of people, gurus, will tell you don't leave voicemails, but then here's my mentality. If I get a call from a number I don't know, A, I'm not answering it, Immediately, I just don't answer it. And if they don't leave a voicemail, it wasn't important. That's what I that's right. Right. I right. So if that's my mentality. I know I'm not like a beautiful, unique snowflake. So someone else has got to think like me too. <laughs> so if I leave a voicemail, there's a higher likeliness that they're going to call me back. And a lot of our leads have come from our callbacks. So my voicemail is really simple. It's really just kind of like the basics of the, the beginning of our, our script. It's like, hey... My name's Chris. I know this is kind of random, uh, but I was calling about a, a property that I, I think you own. Uh, just curious if you'd ever consider getting an offer for it. it totally okay if not, uh, but if you can just give me a call back either way, that way I don't keep bothering you. Very easy, very discreet. It's giving them an out. It's like, hey, I get it. 
If you don't want, if you don't want to operate, get, just give me a call either way. So I just take you off my list. But it ignites it to call me back. All right, your question: lists. Which list to call? First one's pre foreclosure. Pre foreclosure is fantastic. It is the hardest list. You know this. Why would you Why would you think pre foreclosure is the hardest list? Is the hardest hit. It's the hardest hit. Yeah, well, it's not emotional. Is the hardest hit. Every investor. Mm -hmm. the messages she's getting and she's just like what do I do I was like look it'll fall off after your auction date passes you know we'll yep. go and try then she's like okay yeah I'm going to change my number I'm like okay, yep. just wait it out one more month it'll yep. be okay <laughs> well because everyone gets that list it's free it's the, it's a free list that you can get I get one email to me every month I just trash it in my email because it's so heavily hit so so heavily hit but it's helpful if you stack it with other motivation levels. Mm -hmm. That's the other part too. So you never wanna just go after one target list. You wanna have one lead stacked with three different motivation types, right? So that tells you you have a really heavy lead. So you may take a list from like 50,000 addresses and condense it down to like 2,000 if you really stack it in well, right? So tax defaults is another good one. These are people who haven't paid their taxes. Liens, if they have any like construction liens, the HOA liens, pulling a lien list and stacking that with other ones really helps out your case. I tried expired and failed listings. It kind of works. I think those work really well if you're trying to go after a creative strategy. Uh, if you want to go for more like a sub two or lease options or anything like that. Uh, if you can stack it and try to find if there's an expired listing that had um, damaged the property, maybe. I, I, I wasted a lot of time on expired and fails. You may be different. Probate's a great one. Uh, a tool that I use, I'll show you here in a little bit, they give me what's called pre-probate, where they have some weird algorithm, I don't know what it is, where it will actually show properties that have an opportunity to go up for probate soon. So where there's been a death and there's property attached to that. Mm -hmm. Exactly, has not gone through probate yet. So I don't know how, where their data points are coming from there, but I could pull a list of, huh? Where do you get that info? Prop stream. Prop stream. Mm -hmm. Bankruptcy, divorce, high equity vacants. That's a big one. The high equity vacants is a huge list. Again, stack that with others because you will waste a ton of time with high equity vacants. I bought a list of like, 3 million addresses in Texas of high equity vacants. And we just been burning through that, just spinning our wheels. People are weird about those houses that are sitting there vacant. You they know? think they're sitting on a gold mine. Yeah, I don't know what to do. Tired landlords are fantastic. That, that's one of the better ones. You get a lot of multifamilies with tired landlords. So the list for tired landlords, I mean, obviously they're not looking for tired landlords, so they're on your list. So is it going to be mostly like people that are having to file for evictions and things like that? Yeah. So it's going to be people like, yeah, if you get like a, uh, homes that have, they've owned for a long time, there have been a ton of eviction filings. Uh, most of the time it's just, we find it's properties, people who bought are absentee owners who've owned a property for more than 10 years. So we just try to reach out to them. Empty nesters, you know, people who, you know, Kids have gone off to college. Now they have this big house. They don't know what to do with it. They're downsizing. Uh, then you have your government lists, code violation, water shutoffs. This is my personal opinion. I like the lists that are harder to get to, right? They take more legwork. Water shutoffs, code violations, driving for dollars. Those are the best lists, in my personal opinion, because all these other ones, I pay $97 a month for a piece of software. I can just go click download and I, now I have 10,000 leads to call. Really easy for these other lists. If I could do that, any of you can do that, right? But who's gonna take the time to email or call all the water departments of every municipality throughout your entire area 
and ask them to follow some Freedom of, it, of, uh, Freedom of Information Act to send you the water shutoffs within a certain time period. And then deal with their monotony of why they're not going to send it to you and then fight back with them. You know, not a lot of people are going to do that. But they're great because you can get the code violations, the water shutoffs, and those people, they have a motivation because they're not paying their water bills. They have code violations on the property that they're not taking care of. So that it's the higher motivation and less people calling them. So obviously, and this is on free service correct, mm -hmm. once you've kind of established a relationship with the people, you don't fight them as much anymore, no. right? They're like, oh, I know, it, yeah, okay, I'll send it in. Right, exactly. At that point, you can just follow up with them. Hey, Christine, how's it going? But the initial legwork is fighting people. Yes, exactly. The initial one. Build, it's, it's building the relationship, building the trust. It's just crappy when that person loses their job, and then you got to start over. How do you get a list of tired landlords and what's your name? So you can pull that list with like batch leads and prop stream. Just go in, just run a list. Actually, prop stream's easy. They actually have a filter for tired landlords. They have an algorithm to it, but you can just go in. I always like to just go in and say, hey, look, I'm looking for absentee owners who've owned a property for 10 plus years with equity. Really easy. You had someone over here. Yep. You go sign with the buyer or something. Mm -hmm. I know it's going to be because you're there, but you're going to kind of basically just pick it up from. Yeah, I, I, I like the cadence. I okay. keep the same cadence of the call. Yeah. Okay. Yep. For the uh, code violations and water shutoffs, um, what are the variations between these? In other words, how is it stated? Is it the same story everywhere? Or is it mm -hmm. So the Freedom of Information Act is the same everywhere you go. Is that national? That's national. But as far as who you reach out to is different. So you, every every city is different. Some so of them. It's not just the personality of the person in mm -hmm. just one issue. Right. But they may actually have formal rules within yep. their city that are different. Yeah. You have some municipalities will say, hey, you need to fill out this form, mail it here. You have to pay. Some make you pay for it. So some will say, yeah, you have to send a check for this amount. Some over here will give it to you, no problem. Some will send you send it to you on a CD still like it's so weird uh, but every city has different rules so you want to keep like a spreadsheet and in that spreadsheet you want to say okay I have Fort Worth City this person talk here call this phone number here's the process Lake Worth this process like you want to have everything laid out in that end so it's more leg work but once you define the process hand that to a VA have, have a VA have an assistant have someone else take care of it for you and that'll take care of it for you every single month. But it's more legwork, but better leads. Me personally, that's all I focus on. Driving for Dollars has been the one lead source that has produced almost all of my cold call leads. Are you still just driving? You said you don't go to properties. Right, so I don't anymore. Um, so we've gotten a little lazier with Driving for Dollars, I'll be honest. We've migrated more into a virtual driving for dollars model, which I'm not fond of. But again, I'm a cheapskate. I don't want to pay for gas. So what we do basically is that we have, with certain tools, you can just go in. It gives you like a Google Street View. And you can drive down the street in Google Street View, uh, which is nice now because a lot of the Street View images have been updated within the last year. So they've gotten a lot better. Um, but there's still some streets, so you'll like, drive down the road, it's from 2022, and then you click one more house over, and it jumps back to 19, it goes back to like 2005. Yeah, yeah I found one house I was looking at where the street view was showing a house that was very old and run down, and if you went around the corner, it had been completely rehabbed. Yeah. And I was like, what is going on? Yeah, it's so weird. Again, we've gotten lazier with that, and that's just purely for scalability. Me personally, if I get the opportunity, I will drive a neighborhood because I, I love going through neighborhoods and you, you have indicators you'll see of distress. Like a roof is caving in over here. They're not taking care of their lawn very well. This is boarded up. They'll see houses that are not showing up very well on Google Street View. But you find those indicators that are not showing up in tools like Batch Leads or PropStream because there is no filter in these systems that say shitty house. I've looked, it's not there. So I was gonna ask if you can, if you can use that as shown by the 
age of the neighborhood? Since not necessarily. Not necessarily? Yeah, some neighborhoods, yes, depending on the area. But like there are certain pockets of town, like here in, like in Fort Worth where I'm from, there are certain pockets of town where you have older 1920s, 1930s homes that have been totally re-renovated and it's a beautiful neighborhood. And you have other pockets over here where all the homes are like 1940s, 1950s, and it's a total war zone that no one wants to touch. So you can't base on the age of the community. What I like to do is I take a look, since I'm a wholesaler, I take a look at a broad spectrum and say, okay, where are people flipping homes? Where are people buying homes for cash? And I'll see, okay, in this radius right here, I have a huge cluster of people who are buying homes for cash. We target that neighborhood. I make it that easy. Sometimes, yeah, I mean, again, you kind of have to keep up with what's going on with certain trends. So that's why things like what we're doing here, talking to other investors and seeing, okay, where are you guys buying at? You can start seeing those trends of going, oh, I never thought about that neighborhood because that place just looks like garbage. But now you're telling me this place is coming up, is up and coming. Like there's a neighborhood right by my office in Fort Worth called uh, Como. So it's right off of Lake Como. And when I first moved here, my wife, she's from here. She's like, you don't go to Como. Stay away from Como. That place is just, no, stay away from it. That place is growing. It's being redeveloped. Investors are going there like crazy, totally redeveloping it. But the age of the neighbor had nothing to do with it because it's just all a matter of where people are starting to buy. So I follow the trends of where other investors are going because that's how I make my money is through other investors. But it all depends on what your investment model is. Where do you want to invest? Do you want properties closer to you? Do you want properties that are further away? Are you looking more for cash flow? You gotta kind of, you have to make those determinations first before you pull your list of where do you want to invest. Are you finding out other people get involved with cash? So with tools like PropStream, you can, actually has a filter in there that'll show properties that were purchased recently or were purchased without a lien. When you when you say without a lien, you're talking about without a mortgage. A mortgage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it, it will define like hard money loans differently than a conventional financing. What about if it was purchased at two? Because it was purchased with an appraisal lien, would it not? So PropStream does look at seller carry back. So it, I don't know exactly. They, I think there's a filter in there that shows seller carry back. Um, but there, I'm not sure how it works fully. But it will show, um, like if you look at the mortgage history, it will show you that they have a mortgage, which is a seller, seller, seller carry mortgage. Yep, so you on MLS, if you have MLS access for your region. For me, I, I do the entire state of Texas. I only, I only have MLS here in DFW, but I can look across the entire state. But if you have MLS in your region, then yeah, definitely click cash sales, and that's the quickest way to get to it. Have you ever tried filters? I don't like it. Me neither. I don't like it. I've tried them all. I, I have literally tried everything. If there's a new software, I pick it up. I'm looking at this one now, what is it called? It's a new free one that... Some guru is pitching. It's total garbage. <clears throat> but yeah, I, I've tried pretty much everything. I don't like Privy much. So with PropStream, is that something that I mean, seems like that's a, a good place to get started with mm -hmm. trying to list? Yeah, I personally like PropStream, and that's not just because I'm an affiliate, but I like it because it's literally I use it every single day. I've tried Batch Leads. I've tried Privy. I've tried Propelio. I've tried all these different systems. And I still, I'm subscribed to all of them still, but I always go back to PropStream. It's called PropPRO. Yeah, PropStream. Uh, in uh, your handout, you see there's a QR code. If you scan that QR code, you, they'll give you a link to go to PropStream for like free seven day trial. Oh, really? Do you guys go to PropStream Yep. Well? Yeah, so there was a controversy a couple of years ago where PropStream was the only honest company who came out and said that they lost MLS data. Uh, what they mean is they lost the ability to show legally what properties sold on the MLS, the exact amount. So there was a whole controversy saying, oh, PropStream lost their data. Everybody flooded to batch leads, but then they found out batch leads had the same issue as PropStream. PropStream was just upfront about it. PropStream was upfront about it. They, they let people know. And now, if, even if you look at batch leads, it'll show you the same exact number that PropStream does for the most part, sometimes it's different, but they try to say that's the actual MLS data, but it'll still show like 152,396. It'll show you some funky number.
but they will just say that's the actual number. Whereas PropStream says estimate. Because what PropStream is actually doing is a little tricky way. They're adjusting by like a slight bit of a percentage. So if it sold for $152,000, it'll show $152,250 or $152,500. Like it'll show some funky number. So just round it up or down. Yeah, you pay for one service, you get access to everything. And I think with their base service, you can download up to 10,000 leads a month. And that's recycled. Every single month, you get download 10,000 leads. Whereas like batch leads, you're capped out. It's like once you hit that 100,000, you have to buy more. Yeah, exactly. So prop stream every month, it just re-ups. Yes. Yep, PropStream. Hmm? Yeah, because they, they cover nationally. So PropStream gives me access to data across the entire nation. Yeah, I have access to I have the whole nation. So with PropStream, you pay one month service, you get the entire nation. So we started picking up deals in Florida. We did one in Oklahoma. I focus primarily in Texas, but I can do anywhere with PropStream. 97 bucks a month. Yeah, it's 100% worth it. Yeah. All of them. So any third party vendor, any third party vendor has lost MLS access. Yeah, they have the, they have the data. They cannot legally display what the exact amount is that it's sold for. Yes, it's close enough. And some places will do like a range. Like privy, yeah. Yeah, that's right. But yeah, MLS is the only one that has MLS. Yeah, MLS, bar none, if you have MLS access, use the MLS. But if you're doing things virtually, PropStream gives you a close enough number to work off of. There's only been a couple of times where it's thrown me askew, and that's because there's certain data, like uh, Saber has a private MLS, it, can't, it doesn't get access to Saber's private MLS. So I get a few things that throw me off a little bit, but I wholesale, so it's not that big of a problem for me. I like using MLS the most. Yeah. You can always see the, the MLS out there. Obviously. Yeah. But when you're doing 30, 40, 50 comps a day, you it burns you out. Your way of doing it. It's a little bit more time. Yeah. I can see you playing some Elio, and then when I'm about to go under contract, I'll rerun my comps yep. on MLS and see if I can do it. I'll do the same thing. And that's why my process, whenever I'm going through all my leads, I do everything in prop stream. Yeah. And the same thing, as soon as I'm either about to go to contract or I am already under contract, then I'll re verify on the MLS. So you're not wasting time on stuff yeah. that's not going to actually go anywhere. Yeah. It takes a lot longer to do them on MLS. Yeah. Well, the other benefit with like prop stream is I get mortgage information too. So from there, I can see if there's a divorce going through, are they under bankruptcy, are there any liens, are there any mortgages, when was it last sold? I get all that in one dashboard versus looking in like three different places with the MLS. And in uh, other states, this is in Texas obviously, but if you're looking in other states that are disclosure states, it'll show you all the properties that sold off market too. So, handy. Uh, but this is some resources to find some, find your data. Again, I pitch PropStream just because I really like them. I literally use it every single day. Propelio is another one here locally, uh, made uh, by Daniel Chad Moore out of here at Arlington. Great guy. He kind of gone off a little bit. Hasn't done much. The software is the same. Kind of hard to work with, in my opinion. Propelio. I do like Propelio. I'm, I don't want to give them a bad rap because they actually do give you live MLS information. Yeah. Whereas PropStream is a few days behind. PropStream batchlies are a few days behind. This one will give you live stuff within a day. So if something went live on the MLS today, I'll see it or sold or whatnot. So it's actually pretty good data on that end. The interface is just really hard to see and it doesn't cover as broadly. Like there are certain parts of Texas. I think I tried doing comps in like Texarkana and it wouldn't pull it up because it was outside of the region or Lubbock. They didn't have anything for those regions. But it, it, it depends. So not as broad of a reach. National data across the entire country. What's the second one? Huh? What's the second one? 
Rebo Gateway, I don't know, honestly, this is a little old. I'm not sure if they're still in business. This is a service I used a long time ago to pull a lot of my uh, probate and deceased records, um, as well as bankruptcies. So I, I met the owner of Rebo Gateway a few years ago, and they had a really rock solid service, but I haven't used them in a while. I threw it up here as an option. A little bit. I, again, I tried it and I dumped it yeah, because it's prop stream because the all inclusive right. situation. Prop stream. Does prop stream where is it here? Trace? It does, but don't use it. Don't use it. So they have a skip tracing service. I think they only charge like eight cents a record or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's not too terrible, but the data is wrong. Yeah, I, I'll pull my list from PropStream, mm -hmm. and then I'll skip it with batch skip tracing. Yeah, because batch skip tracing, they'll skip trace my leads, mm -hmm. and they'll check the do not call list and the litigator list. So, and their data is pretty accurate. And I put all this back in the back alley. Yeah, <laughs> if you need help, let me know. My contact information is in the packet. What's the batch, uh, the skip trace you use? Uh, batch skip tracing. So it's batchskip.com or batchskip.io. Yeah, it, I have a QR code on there. If you scan the QR code, it'll go to a link tree. And there's a link in there where you can go to there, yeah. I try to make it easy as best I can. <clears throat> um, successors data. Again, this is an older one, but it's probably one of the better places to get uh, probate leads because those, those are, they're actually doing a ton more data aggregation for probates. Uh, and then at the end of the day, if you really have the time, county courthouse, that's the freest way. Well, and some of, so some counties, yeah. like some counties are smaller counties. I live in a smaller county, yeah. not on like REIQ. It's not covered on their like all of Texas. Yeah. And those are, that particular county that I live in is mm -hmm. very user friendly and it's, it's all there and it'll show, it'll click it and it'll show the actual paper file and yeah. you can get the name and address usually, and then you just run it till it gets trained. Oh, yeah. So, and usually, you know, being a smaller county, there's not thousands. There's like between, you know, three and 20 each month. Yeah. Oh, okay. I think we just, I think we went over time. Did we? Less than 10 minutes. Oh, okay. Shoot. All right, guys. Well, I'm going to end it right there. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, Go ahead. Real quick. Uh, I think maybe a lot of people can relate that they get stuck in their head, you know, the fear of court costs. Yes. We talked about consistency. So I don't know if was that a struggle for you or you have mm -hmm. any tips to help build that consistency in your case? Yeah. So there's the term saying that you have the, the thousand pound phone, right? So the, the phone, whenever you try to get onto cold calling, the phone just weighs a thousand pounds. This is a big old brick for you to try to lift up. It is a pain. It is, it is a struggle. The biggest thing is you got you to gotta bust through it. The more you do it, the more calls you make, the easier it will get. But it is a struggle. So the, the, the fear of the phone is, the, is very, very, very real. So how to say it without being too repetitive. You have to force yourself to get onto the phone. And the more calls you make, you will do more and more and more of them. And just mess it up. Don't worry about being pristine. Don't worry about being clean. Don't worry about having the most professionalism. My first few calls, I wish I had them recorded still because they were horrible. They were, they were bad. It was like, uh, yeah, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> but you take those calls, you listen to them, record your calls. In Texas, you're totally okay to record your calls. This is a, a one party state. Record your calls, listen to them, critique yourself. And just go back, okay, maybe I shouldn't have said this, maybe I would have said this, and just critique yourself and just do better every single time. It's another, another reason why I said 1,000 calls yourself and then hire out. Because you can't teach somebody to get over that fear if you never got over it yourself. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Not a problem, guys. Any more questions, concerns? I think I'm keeping everybody from lunch. All right, guys, thank you so much for coming. Hopefully you learned something. My contact info is on the sheet somewhere here. So how was that? Did you get a lot from it? Did they answer a lot of the questions that you have about cold calling? 
was there anything that you weren't quite sure of anything that maybe i muddled on about quite a bit uh if so don't worry about it like i said my contact information is going to be below uh, or you, i'll be uh, available through facebook or instagram or wherever you see this you can always try to reach out to me I may not be able to get to you immediately, but I want to answer your questions. I want to be here as a resource for you guys as much as I can. Uh, keep in mind, I still have a business to run myself, but I do want to do I do want to do what I can to give back to you guys because this community, this group, has really provided a lot for me, and I want to do what I can to provide it back to you. So I know there's a lot there. I know it was a long video and I'm so sorry for making this even longer, but I'm hoping you got some kind of value out of it. And if you did, I would love it if you would just you know, let me know down below. Let me know what you guys took from this. Let me know what you guys liked from it. If there's anything that you felt as if we need to improve on uh, or need a deeper dive into. But I want to you know, definitely answer those questions as much as possible. So. Thank you guys so much for having me at the convention here in Dallas. And, you know, and I cannot wait for the next one so I can meet more of you guys. So until next time, I'll see you guys again. Bye.